here it comes. We'll we'll get her up to speed. So I'm Rupali. Um, I'm the infectious disease and antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist here at the U. I work with Paul Ponger, who's a physician and trained in ID, and together we make the antimicrobial stewardship team. I'll go into a little bit about what that is and how that impacts your care. Um, how many of you guys have heard of what antimicrobial stewardship programs are? One, two. Okay. So maybe do you mind just introducing yourself and telling me what center you came from? Is that okay? Okay, we'll start over here in Nashville. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, yeah, Nashville. Nashville. Vincent, Tallahassee. Tallahassee. Beth. Um, I'm from around here. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Todd, I'm from around here. Jennifer, pardon me. Oh, okay, oh, great. Catherine, um, for all intents and purposes, I'm from around here. It came from Providence Everett. Providence. Okay, Providence Everett. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So antimicrobial stewardship is really a program to help you guys use antibiotics better so we can have them last as long as possible. So, um, okay, I'm going to get this messed up. So first we'll, do, we'll start with a quick little case, and we'll get back to this case. This is an 86-year-old man admitted to the wards for CHF exacerbation. A Foley is placed for eyes and nose. Day four, he has a white count that's relatively normal, no signs or symptoms of urine culture, but it's sent for a culture anyways, and enterococcus grows and he's given levofloxacin. So day six, his CHF is better and he's ready for discharge, but now he has massive diarrhea, C. diff is positive, and it's an extra week long of a length of stay, dehydration, lower reimbursement rate, and misery for everybody. So this is a typical type case that we we hope that we can avoid, but this is kind of a nice learning case that we can, we'll kind of dive into how this applies to your practice. So antibiotic stewardship, it's really, we're here as guidance for you guys, but you guys are really the ultimate antibiotic stewards of our antibiotics. You guys will, um, we were gonna give you the resources that you need to have the best practices and the best use of antibiotics. So in the US, we use a lot of antibiotics. 20% of all antibiotics in, in, um, consumed are in humans. The rest, the 80% are actually found in agriculture, and our food products, and our livestock, which is crazy amounts. Um, and so the, it's only 20%, so you, it's, it's only a small fraction. But the ones that we do give to humans, it's over 300 million, 300 million courses per year in the United States. And most of these are in the outpatient. But um, there are studies that show, even though we give antibiotics frequently, 50% of the time in the hospital, 50% of those are inappropriate. And when I say inappropriate, I mean either the dose is wrong, the duration is incorrect, or it's just the wrong drug that's too broad. So we're here to help you with that. Now, there, one of the reasons why I asked where you guys are from, there's a lot of regional differences on how antibiotics are prescribed. In West Virginia, you can see um, there's almost 1,200 prescriptions per 1,000 patient days versus Alaska. And this is probably has to do with a lot of the population as well. It's a less dense, but only 533 prescriptions per 1,000 people. And you can see, so <laughs> I'm not going to pick on anybody, but you can see that the antibiotic consumed in different, in different regions, the top five are, are listed here. Um, so this is why we have a stewardship program is because we see the um if well, this didn't work out but you can see here you can see the trend that mrsa rates are increasing vre and fluoroquinolone resistant pseudomonas is also increasing over time at the same time as we're seeing increasing amount of resistance we are seeing a lot less new antibiotics so we kind of have a problem where we, we don't have a lot of new antibiotics to combat these more resistant infections. So who we are, I've already introduced ourselves. Um, so some of the things to think about is antibiotic resistance is going to be getting worse. <laughs> and it's a really one of the big problems is we've misused them in, in humans. Um, and unfortunately, the, the discovery pipeline is low. Uh, so we must control our destiny. This is my, my boss's slides. He likes to be very dramatic. Um, we must control our destiny. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Susan. Um, so really, antibiotics, now I'm talking to the cardiology group. Antibiotics are one of the unique class of antimicrobials that are a class of drugs that what you prescribe the patient in front of you actually impacts every patient around them. So if you give an antibiotic and, and a patient develops C. diff, it impacts the rest of the patients. This is, this is not the same for beta blockers or whatnot. If you treat the patient with a beta blocker, it's not going to impact everybody around them. 
So really taking that into heart is really Im important. Um, have you guys met Jenny and Susan? They're the clinical pharmacists that work, will be working with you guys. So feel free to chime in at any, any time. Um, so this becomes a huge problem where we have this area of sp spiraling empiricism where you have, you give, you give broad spectrum antibiotics, it develops multi-drug resistant organisms, then you see a rise in these, and you, when, then whenever you have a patient in front of you, you're worried about MDRO or multi-drug resistant organisms, and it just becomes this awful, awful spiral. So we, we're here to help you and help provide resources um, to, to guide you for best practices. Um, our philosophy is that we generally, what's best for your patient is best for everybody else. Um, we're fine with big and broad antibiotics, totally fine, but as soon as you get micro, we really want you to try to de-escalate and narrow. Um, so I don't know when you guys came from different medical centers. Um, antibiotics, we're one of the only academic medical centers that don't restrict to antibiotics. So I'm not sure in Nashville if they, if they had things under control. They rotated. Yeah. They rotated them, yeah. yeah. And so there's lots of different methods, and it, it, here at the U we haven't, and Harborview, we have not gone to that method yet. If it gets really bad, we might, but we're very lucky um, that we have, both stewardship directors at UW and Harborview are very pro-provider and wants you guys to learn and to use antibiotics at your own will, and we can, we can help with that. So we really want to empower you guys to feel comfortable with per, to prescribe antibiotics. So. Um, in general, so, yep. So what, how would you describe getting worse? Because the picture you just painted it looked like it's pretty pretty dismal. <laughs> like, like there's less there's less uh, less antibiotics being approved, and then there's more more and more drug resistant organisms. So like, at what point would you say that it's that it's getting bad enough? Getting bad enough, yeah. And so it, it really depends on. Um, so for example, we've had outbreaks at Harborview with multi drug resistant Acinetobacter infections. Um, and it's really, um, it is really something that we monitor yearly, and we really look at our antibiogram to say how often do we, can we use our meropenem and things like that. Um, but it's also political, as you may know, the U and Harborview are very big places, and so we, we're, we do have certain antibiotics restricted, which I didn't tell you about, that certain ones that are um, really for those multi-drug resistant ones, um, and it's really, it's really something that we are we evaluate every year, but yeah, it is pretty visible now. I mean, the culture is people don't like to be told what to do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, culture, right? so that's, that's what I mean. yeah, no, I think that that's a definitely a valid question. So one of the things that we do is I do a daily review, and um, somebody at Harborview, a pharmacist at Harborview, also does this review certain high value, high risk antibiotics. And what we do is we are reviewing them on the back end because we know that people don't like to be told what to do. Um, and we, we often call your clinical pharmacist or we call your um, attending if, if, or call you guys if we're really concerned about this. So certain high values, so this is something, uh, Todd, that changes over time. Some years we're looking at daptomycin and linazid. Some years we're gonna be really looking at carbapenems every single, every single patient that's on it. For example, right now we have a, a national Zosin shortage. So every patient that's getting prescribed Zosin there is a pharmacist reviewing that and making phone calls to the team. So Paul or I will make phone calls to you guys directly, or we will call your service pharmacist to, to help guide you guys to, uh, to potentially narrow um, therapy. Um, one of the great resources that we have is something called ACO, which is Online Clinical Care Algorithms and Messaging. And I'm not sure if you guys have a lot of clinical guidelines on this, but we have a section here um, for antibiotics, and we have, let's see, and so it, it is um, a great resource, and it has, we also have a card version of this, and I'll, I'll pass these around um, for you guys. Um, it also is a nice little iPhone app that you can, when you download it, it is a, what we call like a web link, so it's not a true app, but it, it is supposed to be friendly with Android and, and, um, uh, and iPhones. Um, so it's, it, it is an, it's a nice resource for you. you. See, it has this nice formatting, and you can go there and look at different disease states and and what our recommendations are. So some of the resources that you have um, again the Occam, which is phone and online, um, all any order set that has an antibiotic on it, Paul or I are reviewing to make sure that they are um, in sync with our our national guidelines as well as our local um, uh, flora. 
We also, the service pharmacists get updated a lot about uh, antibiotics and they're actually really good with, with antibiotics and so using them as a resource is very important. And then lastly, the ID consult service. So the director for stewardship is also the director for the ID consult fellows or the, the fellows. So feel free to get an ID consult. And um, I know that it's not a high um, reason to get ID consults on cards and CCU, but some of the reasons that you may consider getting an ID consult, if you have a bug that you can't pronounce, you see a lot of R's, you, uh, <laughs> if you, um, if you're using more than three antibiotics, I mean, those kind of things, it's, it's worthwhile. Or if you have used antibiotics for more than four weeks, like uh, endocarditis or whatnot, they're great at managing these things outpatient where you guys may not want to do that. Um, we also have a LMS module. This is my cute little avatar. Um, it, uh, we have a, what we call a, like almost like a web study where we go over four cases, a HAP, a C. diff, a CAUDI, um, and, a, and a VAP. And we kind of have some discussions. It shouldn't take you more than half an hour. So when I send you guys the slides, you're welcome to do this um, this uh, little LMS module. We're trying to make it required for everybody, but as you know, it's hard to get <laughs> things required here. Um, we're trying to get it required for all providers here at the, at the U and, and Harborview. Okay, so some of our specific initiatives, which I think might be important to go over. So going back to this first case we talked about, this 86-year-old man admitted for a CHF exacerbation. Um, there was a Foley place for I's and O's, and then on day four, he had a white count of 10 and no signs or symptoms of urine, uh, urinary tract infection, but a urine culture was sent anyways. Came out with 100,000 urine enterococcus, and it was treated with um, so I think the important teaching point about this is this patient had no signs or symptom of a urinary tract infection and the antibiotic potentially led to this this case of C. diff. So one of the um, one of the initiatives we have is that to try to avoid catheter related UTIs whenever possible. As you guys know these are common healthcare infections. For every day that a catheter is in, you have a 10% risk of having bacteria, and a fourth of those then can lead to um, potentially ca um, ca caudi. Um, so these are the guidelines for appropriate indications for Foley catheters. You guys are probably more of an expert on this than I am, but keep in mind this is something that does get audited um, on the background sometimes, and we are, um, catheter-related UTIs are kind of a publicly reportable um, disease as well as we we get um, reimbursed less. So really keep these in mind. Um, all the the post-op power plans all have this language in there. If you do choose to keep it fully in longer than any of these guidelines suggest, to make sure to just document it so that the the, the auditors and whatnot can um, can uh, understand where you're coming from. And Carrie can probably talk more about that than than I can. Um, so just to remind that often the misdiagnosis of CAUDIs or catheter-related UTIs can lead to the overuse of antibiotics. This has been studied nationally, um, all over, uh, yeah, nationally, especially in the VA hospitals. And so I just want to remind that the definition um, is really for the symptomatic patients um, and that they're, we're looking for a growth of greater than 10 to the third. Um, and the symptoms, obviously, the, the, fe the fever, supra, uh, pubic, and um, CVA tenderness are all um, important signs and symptoms. Um, the other thing, a new initiative we have is what we call a reflexive UA and culture. So this is a special test that basically only runs the culture if the UA is positive. So you do have to order this as the UA and reflexive urine culture test. You can order them individually. That's not a problem if you have a high suspicion for concern. Um, for UTI, definitely you could send this, but this is a nice way to avoid excessive treatment. Um, just remember this is not appropriate for pregnant women or um, immunocompromised patients, which I don't know how much you guys will see on your service, but if you do, this isn't appropriate. So the, the criteria for running the urine culture is um, greater than one RBCs, presence of uh, leukocyte esterase, greater than one uh, WBCs, or nitrate, greater than one plus. So again, this is really up to you guys whether or not you'll order this test. It's not the default by any means, but it is there um, to help, again, reduce the number of um, 
potentially over treating some of these uh, infections. Why do you say it's not appropriate for pregnant? Because for pregnant women, um, oops, where, hold on, let me go back here. Um, oops, please. Because um, the pregnant women, we treat bacteria regardless. And so we wouldn't want the UA not to indicate. So for those patients, you would definitely order both. You, yeah, you would you would order them separately. separately yeah, you sorry. could even just probably order just a urine culture because okay. we would treat them regardless. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oops. Okay, I am not good with this thing. Here we go. Preview. Okay. Okay. So other hospital acquired infections, which are that will potentially be on your ra radar, so C. diff, diarrhea, uh, catheter-related line infections, vent-associated pneumonia, and surgical site infections. And what this really means is that these are we have the whole infection control department that is monitoring this. Now, I think ventilator-associated pneumonia is not officially a reportable. Um, uh, uh, infection to um, CMS or to um, or to the public but it, it's supposed to be so I think in 2016 and the only reason why I tell you guys about this is so then if you do have questions um, that you can always reach out to stewardship or infection control about this um, so I don't know many of you guys are from the area um, but this we recently was this was recently published in the Seattle Times comparing all of our hospitals across um, the state, um, uh, looking at our MRSA infections, our C. diff, central lines, catheter-related UTIs, and surgical site infections. And this is using some of our infection control data and comparing it against the, the uh, baseline U.S., um, uh, what do you call it, uh, baseline rates or benchmarking. And you can see here that, you know, UW, we're, we're actually doing pretty good. Um, I think that's pretty good thinking about some of our patient populations that are pretty sick. I, I'm pretty happy with this. But just to keep in mind that this is publicly reported and patients may may bring this up and, and to feel free to reach out to infection control should should some, some questions arise. Um, yeah, this was just, it's one of those things that we, it's our little, it's always embarrassing to have this in, in the media, but but it's, it's a good thing we have more, more resources because it's now publicly reported. Okay, some other stewardship initiatives. Um, so this is another case, a 50-year-old man with CHF admitted for volume overload, disputing on, on exertion, and increasing edema. On hospital day three, he vomited twice. His white count was normal, but he became febrile overnight. Chest x-ray shows bilateral infiltrates, and you're concerned about pneumonia and possible aspiration. So what would you recommend? I like it. Somebody's looking at the card. Okay. Community acquired pneumonia. Okay. So we could call this either healthcare associated or we could do ceftriaxone. The, the main thing I want to emphasize is these people less than four days of hospitalization or they have aspiration, we're really worried about regular oral anaerobes and gram positives. Um, and it's important to send a sputum and gram stain. Um, we really want to make sure that we consider using either cefepime or the ceftriaxin, as Todd mentioned, but we really want to avoid using Zosin. This is a, a huge um, issue. We now have a sh national shortage of this, and, and um, we see that on medicine, as well as on cardiology, it's one of the top drugs that are used, and we really want to avoid using the Zosin. Zosin is a great um, drug, but it's really meant for hospital-acquired interabdominal infections. And if you look at our blue card here of guidelines, that's the only place where Zosin does appear, is for interabdominal in infections. Um, and this is for the hospital-acquired type. Um, and generally for that, uh, we do give Vanco if there's a history of MRSA, and the typical duration is four to seven days. So. Also, if you do order Zosin, it's important to know that we give it over what we call a prolonged infusion, and this is one of the, in response to our poor, um, our, our poor uh, susceptibility rate, 
we opted to do this prolonged infusion. And what this really does is just maximizes the drug. It basically kills the bugs better. And this was when we saw that, um, I should pass out these antibiograms. Um, when we saw that our pseudomonal rate um, or Sosin um, susceptibility rate to pseudomonas was close to uh, 80%. This is why we opted to, to go for this, this option. All this really means is that you need to, um, that you don't really need to know it, do anything. The, the pharmacy will automatically substitute all zosins for this prolonged infusion. The reason why you may or may not, this may affect your patient if you do use zosin is it does take a lot of time. It takes 12 hours out of 24 hours of your line real estate. So if you have a patient with limited access, this could be a problem. But as I mentioned, Zosin will never be reused on your service, right? Because you barely see <laughs> an abdominal infection. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, we're, it, we do have very protocolized, and we've been doing this for probably about four years now with good success. Quickly, I wanted to just go over vancomycin. This is something that we see on your service. Um, just for all, in general, just some few tips and tricks. Um, we used to give zo or vancomycin one gram Q12 for everybody. Um, and generally we didn't do, um, our target trough concentrations were five to 10. With the increasing amounts of resistance, we have now um, changed a lot of our dosing where we use a weight-based dosing nomogram about 15 to 20 milligrams per kilo. And this is on that blue card for you. Also, in patients that are critically ill, we do give a loading dose. So a lot of these patients are on the blue card here. If they are critically ill, we do have a, a weight-based uh, loading dose. Um, so now what we generally do is we, um, we after we prescribe the, do the drug, we after the fourth dose or steady state, we draw a trough level. And usually our target trough is greater than 10. Some of our um, infections require a little bit higher dosing, such as 15 to 20. Um, and this is generally for the bacteremia, the endocarditis, the osteomyelitis, and pneumonias caused by Staph aureus. Um, so another quick case. So we have a 70-year-old female start on Vanco from parasepsis. Cultures are pending. Serum creatinine is 0.6. Weight is 85. Estimated creatinine clearance is about 70. Um, the team pages you, or I guess they're, yeah, the, the bedside nurse pages you saying the vanco level is really high. Um, the patient is on 1.25 grams IVQ12. After the third dose, the level is 27.5. Or, yeah, 27.5. What is your next step? Hold vanco. What else? What other questions do you guys have? So one of the things we want you to think about is consider when the dose was drawn. Um, we, we try really hard to educate the, the bedside nurses as well as um, the lab to make sure that it, it does cor uh, correlate with a true trough. And you can see here, this was actually drawn in the middle between the one o'clock and the, the 1300 dose. So it's actually a midpoint level, so it's really not a, um, it's really not a true trough. So some things to consider when you get called about these levels is, is it at steady state? Meaning was it drawn after the third dose? Um, was it drawn correctly 30 minutes prior to the dose? And what is our target trough level as well as, and then what should you recommend? I generally would agree if this was a true trough of anything greater than 20, I generally hold the next dose and then do a dose reduction. But both Susan and Jenny will be around to help with all with the the Vanco um, dosing. So troughs are drawn after the third. Yes. Yeah. yeah, after the third dose, and then right before. Yeah, right before the fourth. Yeah. Perfect. Another um, situation that we do see um, is this case here. It's a 59-year-old male ventilated uh, patient with MRSA pneumonia. Creatinine is good. Creatinine clearance is greater than 120. He's getting 1.5 grams IVQ 12 times four doses. The level before the fifth dose came back at 13.8. The IV consult service has recommended they want a target concentration of 15 to 20. What do you do next? So the questions to continue to ask yourself, is this drawn at steady state? Is it drawn correctly? What is the target trough and what would you recommend? So we're at 13.8, our, our level is about 
is, or our target level is 15 to 20. So I'll give you a hint. The, um, the primary team did increase the dose by 25%, and unfortunately, the trough then came back at 34. So what this really is trying to illustrate, and this is a real case taken from Harborview, um, is that really keeping in mind that this 15 to 20 that ID may recommend is not absolute. Something plus or minus here and there is, prob is probably fine. The data that validates this target drop of 15 to 20 is actually not based on the, the, the bar set by cardiology <laughs> with uh, randomized control trials. It's really based on retrospective cohort analysis. So this is not absolute. So feel, feel free to use your judgment if it is, it is close and the patient is clinically responding. Again, your clinical pharmacists on service are definitely going to be helping you um, guide you through this. Anything you guys want to add about the Banco? No? Okay. 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 The next case is 64-year-old female, so plus cabbage one month, comes in the clinic with complaints of fever, chills, times 24 hours, reports eating out at the newest, fanciest restaurant, have an episode of diarrhea, followed by chills and subjective fever. She has a benign um, abdominal exam, but continues to have high fevers and chills. You decide to admit her, and you place her on IV levofloxacin. So, um... So let's think about what we would want to do. So let's look at our antibiogram, the white card there. So when I think of interabdominal infections, I'm most concerned about E. coli, Klebsiella. Um, so let's look at our antibiogram. We, this provider decided to do IV levofloxacin. So what is our chances of getting that right? If levofloxacin covering the E. coli here at the U, they are split between U and H there. 95? 66. Yeah, 66. Oh, H is Harborview, U. U is UW. Okay. For E. coli. Oh, for E. coli. Yeah. Is 66. 66. So yeah, not great odds. So only two thirds of the uh, E. coli at our institution will be covered by E. coli. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, that hi, Carrie. I decided I'm gonna go. Okay. <laughs> so we we have taken out. <laughs> we. Um, we have used the antibiogram for this patient just to kind of keep in to kind of help justify our um, our empiric guidelines. So this the, this antibiogram is used to kind of help you when you are empirically deciding what to give. But the blue card is taking into account our local flora, our our UW formulary, as well as what's national guidelines say. So feel free to use the antibiogram, but it, it does provide a little bit, it is a little bit uh, non-specific. For example, this is the antibiogram represents all um, sterile sites for uh, patients that are admitted here and seen at the ER. So it may not be reflective, like if you use it in the outpatient setting, it might not be as reflective for your patient population. So you get a blood culture back, it's E. coli. You see that it is tr true in fact. Um, that it is levofloxacin resistant um, and with an MIC of eight. So just to make sure you guys are familiar, so um, we do MIC values for all of our microbiology results. Really, th this MIC value is help determine what the interpretation is. It's important to note that each drug and each bug has a different break or has a different interpretive value. So for example, ceftriaxone for E. coli, the MIC breakpoint is one. For, for staph aureus and ceftriaxone, it's four. So it's really um, important that you just look at the interpretations here. That th these MIC values are really used for multi-drug resistant organisms, if you've got a closed site infection and you need drug penetration, and it's really the SINR should be sufficient for your practice. Um, another thing um, that we have is something called direct sensitivity. So this allows for blood cultures that um, come back, they, they can, we can rapidly turn those around within 12 hours, which is great for you guys as the frontline providers. 
but it's important to note that it, it looks a little different um, in that it says non-standardized sensitivity and there is no MIC value here. The, the important thing to remember is that we cannot use the drug that's not listed here because what they do is they hide any resistant um, susceptibilities so that the providers will only use what's susceptible. We've had uh, incidences where like for example, Zosin is not on here and, pay, and they, will put, they will put a patient on Zosin and then the next day it will come back resistant when they do the final sensitivity. So just keep an eye out for this uh, non-standard sensitivity and to keep that in mind when you are um, practicing. And what this really means in non-standard is they're basically taking the blood, pouring it into the, onto the auger plate um, and so there's not a standard inoculum. So they can't really provide, it often overcalls resistance because it's probably a higher inoculum. And so they'll only send over or only let you guys know what's sensitive. And it's really providing what we call the best case scenario. So if you don't see the drug, don't assume that it's, it's sensitive. But this is contrasted when the standard sensitivity, which is replaced by this within 24 hours. And you can see now, um, this is a pan-sensitive organism, so you could use anything here on, on this panel. Um, and, this sh and this should be replaced again within 24 hours or so. Any questions about that? Why is it replaced again? It's replaced because it's, the, it's, non, it's a non-standard uh, sensitivity. And it's really, it's, there's data to show the the um, sooner that you guys know what is sensitive, the more likely a patient is going to be, be treated with the right antibiotic. So, just to clarify, so do we have to request non-stand? It just comes back automatically. It comes back. hours, and then we look the next day. Yeah. Then, okay. Yeah. No, it's all done. It's um, so first. Yeah. So the non-standard sensitivity will only be done on blood cultures that are positive, mm -hmm. and it will be replaced by the standard sensitivity. Yeah. Routinely, okay. so you don't have to do anything. It's just kind of I always like to let people know because it looks kind of it looks so different And so we've gotten questions about that. So great question. Okay Okay, so the other thing I wanted to touch on is penicillin allergies. This is something that we see a lot in our in our clinical practice, so um, This is highly self-reported in the patient population up to 10% of the of patients report having a penicillin allergy when we drill down and actually do penicillin um, skin testing, very few of these are truly pen allergic. And so we, 10% of people that believe that they have penicillin allergy, in reality it's only 1% that have a true IgE mediated anaphylaxis to penicillin. And why, why as a stewardship pharmacist do I care about this? Well, penicillin allergies um, means mo, mo money more problems. And there's been studies that have shown <laughs> I love, <laughs> I love my uh, P. Diddy. Um, recent studies have shown that um, pen allergies actually, patients with pen allergies are more likely to have drug resistant infections, um, longer hospitalizations, more C. diff and, and MRSA and VRE. And it's probably because they are using some of these wackadoodle put together um, antibiotics that are not necessarily standard of care. And so we, um, we're very lucky here at this institution where we have two allergists on staff here that can help discern um, some of these penicillin allergies. Um, and it's just important to remember that allergies can be classified into two different, or adverse drug reactions can be classified into two different things, type A or type B. Um, and type B is these allergic reactions, and these are the ones that we're most concerned about. And these can range from type 1 to type 4. And the ones that we're most concerned about with antibiotics and the cross reactivity is these IgE mediated um, reactions. There's also idiosyncratic, where we don't know the mechanism, pseudo allergic, and this is very common with the Banco and the Redman syndrome. And then lastly, we have these intolerances, which is I, I took amoxicillin and I got a, um, I, I threw up, you know, those kind of things. It's not a true allergy, but it's rather uh, an intolerance. So these are the ones that we're truly concerned about. And penicillin is the only one where we have a standardized skin testing for. So this is uh, some examples of a true urticarial type rash where we can, um, that where we would not want to re-challenge our patient with, where you can see this extensive wheel and flare with the circumcised uh, redness, with the, the, the central paler that's uh, 
um, that can indicate the wheel of Lart. This is something somebody you wouldn't want to re-challenge with penicillin. And, and also the Stevens-Johnson or the D, um, D, uh, SJS or TEN, where again, you would never want to re-challenge a person with a, the inciting agent. Um, so just a, another a quick case, an 18-year-old male college student presents with group A uh, streptococcal pharyngitis and you prescribe penicillin. The patient informs you that he developed a rash after taking the penicillin, um, after taking half of the doses of the penicillin. Um, the rash was bright red in color, restricted to the extremities and trunk, and resolved a few days after the penicillin was discontinued. So how do you really ask the patient if this is a true, how do you discern whether or not it's an IgE mediated? It, it, it's important to kind of ask, is this truly a pharmacological reaction to the agent? Um, was this a first dose reaction? Um, what was the nature, urticaria, angioedema, anaphylaxis? Um, and what was the time course? Generally immediate um, reaction de generally recommends uh, or su suggests IgE, whereas the other type of reactions were uh, occur greater than 72 hours. In this patient, it happened halfway in the middle of the course, more likely that it was it was not an IgE mediated. Just to kind of touch base on cephalosporin allergies, uh, these are actually better tolerated than uh, penicillins, and a true cephalosporin allergies are quite rare. Most of these are very drug specific to the cephalosporin. I'm not going to bore you with all these great chemical structures that I love, but um, it's really really drug specific and if you do have a patient with a cephalosporin allergy to definitely reach out to allergy work if you need additional help. Um, in general the cross reactivity between somebody with a penicillin allergy and neat and requiring a cephalosporin is generally quite minimal and it's it's there has been several studies when I was in in pharmacy school we said it was almost up to 20 percent this has now been debunked by a lot of more uh, robust studies um, and generally, um, it's actually quite low, about 0.5% as you move up in the, or 0.5% for the first generation and even less for the second, third, and fourth generation. This does not include cefazolin because the, the structure of cefazolin is quite different than penicillin. And this has been really taken to heart by um, some of our surgeons here. Um, Paul and I did a study where we looked at UW medicine um, surgery patients and looking to see how many of them had beta lactam allergies and what their reaction was. And sure enough, our patient population, the reported rate of penicillin allergies was 10%, so right what the national data shows. Of those, 20, 282 patients received uh, cefazolin despite the allergy listed as penicillin, and the, the ranges of the uh, type of reaction is, is listed here and you can see that there was a large portion of them were GI related but there were some anaphylaxis, some hives, some itching um, that were potentially could be concerning. So our next step in this study was to look at all of the anesthesia records of these patients and we found that actually zero out of the 282 patients that actually received the beta lactam or received cefazolin with the documented beta lactam allergy did not have a reaction. There was, out of this group here, we did find that um, there was nine patients that had what, a reported allergic reaction. Only two of these, um, two of these had what, anaphylaxis. One, we think it was due to rocuronium, and the other was maybe the cephalosporin. But again, the remaining had mild reactions. So I think this, inf this information helps um, reassures, reassure, reassures us using cephalosporin in some of these pan-allergic patients. So in our previous, when we had paper orders, we had an order set that did say cefazolin is okay to use even if penicillin allergic. Now we have uh, CPOE, and so this is built in in some of the, the wording. Um, in addition to that, we have what we call um, an evidence link that helps provide um, more discrete questions for you when you're at the bedside to ask whether or not um, patients can receive a penicillin or not. And really we're looking for, again, the first question is indicating whether or not we, the patient had an IgE type mediated. The second question is looking at SJS um, and seeing if, if that was a concern. Also some of these idiosyncratic reactions such as pneumonitis or hepatitis or any other adverse drug reaction. And you can see here it, it helps provide some reassurance for you. And I'm not sure how much of pre-op antibiotics you'll be, um, you'll be ordering, but I think this is also nice to know that you do have backup should you um, decide to give 
uh, acephalosporin to a patient with, with a, a beta-lactam or with a penicillin allergy. So um, we do have skin testing at this hospital, but um, this is kind of an algorithm that was put together by one of our allergists here. Um, they also recommend that if a reaction happened greater than 10 years ago, um, that it's, you're not as concerned for this IgE mediate, and you're not concerned for an IgE, it's probably fine to go ahead and, and, and give a cephalosporin. In the patients um, that it occurred less than 10 years ago, and there's some features, the allergists may recommend what we call a graded challenge. If they have a strong history, they will recommend desensitization. Again, this is not, um, I don't expect that you guys will be doing this on the front lines, but just to know that these resources are available to you. And if there's skin testing available, um, they often do the testing at the, at the bedside for you. Lastly, we have an antibiotic called Astrianam. This is a monobactam, has a chemical structure which is very distinct than penicillins. It is less immunogenic and it is used for, it it's primarily has gram negative coverage, no gram positive. Um, if you do opt to use it, um, you will, uh, an allergy consult will be automatically triggered. Um, the reason why is it's a bad drug. If you, it's not on our antibiogram, but only 60% of our pseudomonas is actually susceptible to astrinam, and it actually costs a lot of money. It's almost $150 a day. So this was a, another stewardship initiative where we um, are having allergy help at the bedside do the interviews and try to lessen some of these penicillin allergies. Um, and in general, um, this has been, we've been doing this for a year now, and we've had some great results and um, great elimination of the, the pen allergies. So, um, I think that's almost it. Um, so I'm sorry that Paul is not here, but I'm sure he'll meet you guys when he's on service. Carrie's worked with him a lot. Um, he, he's a great resource for us, as well as um, I'm here to help as well. And your service pharmacists, Susan and Jenny and uh, Linda, no, just you two? Beatrice. And Beatrice are great resources as well. So with that, I, oops, I want to show you my little cartoon. Um, let me know if you have any questions.